yeah, it's not come up on mine. Right, okay. Pronoun da croisiodi cavavod diolchambau am dod. Good afternoon, welcome to the Regeneration and Public Protection Scrutiny Committee on Tuesday the 16th of November 2021. <laughs> Please note that this meeting is being recorded and may be broadcast via the authorities' in internet site. The images and sound recording may also be used for training purposes within the authority. Um, I'd like to go to the uh, report. Uh, agenda item one, apologies for absence. Uh, no chair or members are present. Um, agenda item two, declarations of interest, including within declarations. Okay. Yeah, sorry, Chair. I'm going to have to uh, declare a personal and prejudicial interest in the homelessness and housing update. The item under HMO for the Rocky Road is in very close proximity to where I, li where I live. So I, I'm going to have to declare an interest in that one and leave the, me leave the meeting, Chair. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, Scott? Uh, thanks, Chair. Not too much a declaration of interest. I did just pop back into the um, scrutiny pre-meeting um, thing and Rebecca is in there, so I'm not sure if anybody needs to update her on that. Um, so I just wanted to let you know the social. OK, thank you. So, Kev, will you be leaving at the start or how would I'm, you want to play? I leave now because we're going straight into that report first, Chair, is that correct? Or uh, yeah, want... it's the only report, yeah. So I, what, um, yeah, I, I didn't know whether Chris, uh, sorry, Alan, I don't know how you're presenting the report. Oh, my God. Sorry, sorry, I nearly went into the I nearly went into the pre meeting then. Somebody keeps inviting me into it. Sorry. I um. So, yeah, sorry, Chris. Um, our, our plan is to talk to the summary of the report because um, it's in five or six blocks. The report so i'm going to give an overview in terms of the summary um and to be honest you we were going to talk about um the positivities yeah. right in terms of the um the developments that we have planned short medium long term and also we were going to finish off with actually talking about the hmos right on section 12 so uh kevin you must have read read our mind really because <laughs> um, that is the the hot topic, but we want to get make sure the report is balanced between what's hot and what's not, and what's the positivity really within the team and what what we're actually driving on. So I hope that's okay for yourself, chair members. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's fine. Yeah, I, yeah, Kev, it's, it's your on that, on that basis, then, chair. I I'll I'll leave the meeting now. Okay, no problem. See you all. Take care. Okay, so thanks for that, Chris. Um, agenda item three, housing and homelessness update report uh, to receive the report from the Def Deputy Chief Executive. So, Al, I, I don't know, Al, whether you want to um, give an give a intro intro. An intro intro, no. I, <clears throat> I think Chris has already covered the uh, the intro, Chair. Um, it's, a, it's a case of we've had issues um, from a housing homelessness perspective. Um, but the team have been working very, uh, very hard with our regeneration uh, uh, um, department, with our uh, partner RSLs, to look at solutions to these problems, to look at solutions to the additional uh, statutory responsibilities, not just for short-term rehousing of this client group, but the commitment of the Welsh Government to move this client group on to secure um, uh, social housing. So we're on a journey. I suppose the issue which will come up um, and which is topical is that's the medium to long term and the, the positive developments that we've got in train. And um, the big issue that we've got, which comes with a statutory responsibility, is what do we do in the short term, where we've got a statutory duty to rehouse um, quite a large cohort of complex individuals. Um, and the the subject which we're going to come on to, which is the development of, uh, of community based HMOs, is currently one of the one of the only immediate solutions at this point in time that we have to meet those statutory responsibility. So that's the sort of that's the timeline and the and the order in which we're going to take it. 
So it's going to be it's going to be happy, pleasant, yeah, setting the scene for not happy and not pleasant. Okay. okay. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Al. Right, so in terms of the summary then, right, as you'll see within the report um, and recognise for the last four or five months, we've been carrying out the review of the service, um, which has been recently uh, approved. Um, and I think a much needed review, really, in terms of the structure of housing. Um, and I think um, as, as we've shown in 2.5 of the report, you can see the in diagrammatic organizational chart format. You can see now the conclusions for that review, which we do feel give uh, a bit of balance really in both, both Suzanne Stevens' role and Suzanne Lewis Habits' role really. Um, so where we split split those functions out. So so I know 1.1 um, and 2.5 talk talk about that in a little bit of detail. Um, 1.2 talks about the increased pressures on the service. Um, and you'll see quite a lot of data really in um, three, uh, section three of the report and 3.5 uh, goes into a little bit of detail in terms of the classifications, the types of um, accommodation that we are uh, pursuing. A um, couple of statements really at 1.3, 1.4, which are facts. Um, costs in terms of the hardship fund or costs for TA at the moment. Um, you'll see a 4.2 in detail um, and there is a risk, you know, uh, that may cease uh, next year. Uh, we're hoping the WG don't pull a plug in us, but at this point in time, we have nothing re formal to say the hardship fund will continue pan Wales. And you can see, as I say, 4.2, the the significant cost uh, that that is, um, um, is taking taking us to and also 1.4 you know over reliant on the use of bed and breakfast accommodation right um and there's some data that in the report that you can see the breakdown breakdown of what that actually actually means um what you will also see on a positive positive side the amount of effort and energy is going into Susie, Susie and Suzanne's work over future developments. And that's, that's encouraging, right? It really, really is encouraging. Uh, and, you know, you'll see at 5.5 a, um, a list there of the number of units that we're actually building out. And I think the total is 109 units that we will build um, over the next um into 2022 and, tw and 2023. Um, last but not least, um, the Housing Service um, took over the the management of future responsibility of the site, the G Glen Mill um, Gypsy and Roma Travelling Site, um, November 20, 2020. And um, we have now a new master plan for the site. Uh, developed that we are driving straight through Welsh Government in terms of securing securing a significant amount of finance for that site as well. Um, as a summary chair, I think those are the critical points that we draw in reference to. You'll see in, in the report quite a lot of detail under uh, the areas I've just referenced. I, I, I should imagine there'll be numerous questions associated with the report. Um, as we've referenced at the start of the meeting, we want to focus on Section 12 in particular, because that is the year and now debate that's currently live. And Suzanne Stevens is going to talk to Section 12 of that report in a, in a little bit more detail so we can demystify HMOs and in particular a couple, couple of properties that um, we've been trying to uh, develop um, over the last couple of weeks. Is that okay, Suze? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, so I think most of you will be aware that we've worked with a HMO module with um, model, model. Excuse me, let me take these out a second. Back is uh, a bit overwhelming then. 
So, um, yeah, we've worked with Duncan Evans from D2 Proco on two existing HMOs um, within the town ward for the past three, three to four years. So more recently now, in order to increase OTA, we've looked at two new properties in particular, um, one in Nantucoid in Troy Daru, um, one in Rocky Road in Pendaran. So mid-September time, um, Duncan Evans um, submitted a planning application for both properties. Um, the, the consultation period for those is due to end sometime this week. In terms of the, the Rocky Road one, I think that's fair to say it's probably been the most, uh, the biggest hot potato then, in that we've had several um, objections from the residents in the area. So as part of the consultation process, myself and Councillor Chris Davis um, visited a few properties last week in Rocky Road and in Mitchell Crescent that backs on to the particular property. Um, again, obviously, despite us reassuring residents that the, the people would be that we would be placing into the HMO would be those with either low or no support needs at all. They do have concerns around the, the stigma, I suppose, that comes with the homelessness in that, you know, despite our reassurances, they have this perception that everyone who comes through housing who is homeless has these multiple complex issues. So obviously we've tried to, to reaffirm that, that that wouldn't be the case, but I know that it is their intention to submit um, a petition to the planning department and that the application is actually going to the planning committee on the 8th of December. In terms of the Nantucoid one, I suppose we've learned from the Rocky Road one in that obviously planning uh, as part of the process of written out to uh, the residents in the vicinity. Um, to advise them of the planning application. Myself and Duncan haven't done the consultation on that yet because obviously we wanted a view from the, the planning officers as to whether it is likely to proceed because what we didn't want is, is obviously the residents um, worrying and sort of up in arms over something that, that may not happen then. So we do intend starting that consultation probably next week when we get a, a better idea from planning colleagues as to whether it is likely to proceed or not. In terms of the, the ward members, I haven't had any um, direct complaints from any ward members in that area. And I know the one objection that has been submitted by a resident just says they object to it and it doesn't actually give any specific reasons as to why. But, you know, I just envisage it's probably along the same lines as those um, opinions expressed from, from those in the Rocky Road area, really. So I, I know the ward members, as Councillor Gibbs has said, he's uh, got a personal interest in this. So, um, you know, it has not been part of that consultation. But I think Councillor Davis has advised us now that um, whereas initially he was in support of this particular model, given the, the, the public objections, that it would be his intention to assist the residents in trying to object to the planning application. So I suppose that's where we are with that. In terms of obviously alternatives for us as officers, um, as we said, in looking at short term solutions, that this does seem the best model, although, you know, we appreciate that the fears um, and the reservations that residents have got are fair. Um, but I think wherever we look to put such a model, whatever it would be in the borough, the same concerns are going to be raised by residents wherever you put it. You know, we've had comments like, oh, well, can you put it away from residential areas, you know? I suppose that's a matter for debate, but even, you know, when we've been looking at suitable properties, we've looked at a total of 27 prior to these two. They've all been refused based on locality or, you know, unsuitability for whatever reason, or we've lost out on the properties because of the way the property market is at the moment, where, as you probably know, properties are being sold overnight. So, you know, it, it is really difficult. And ideally, we would put it in a location where there was, you know, in an area where there were few sort of owner occupiers around it or whatever but that's just really difficult in such a small borough um with the market the way it is at the moment i don't know whether anyone's got any more specific questions they want to ask me around that you know, can i um can i suggest can we just a few more comments on the report and then you can you can scrutinize the report guys I think it, it's uh, um is, would that be okay, uh, Chair? Just if I can just just finish off though our, our summary, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's just, right. Yeah, you, you did mention me demystified some of the rumours around the HMOs. I don't know if you cover that now. Um, 
in terms of, like you, you know we all see there's a, there's a need for it but you know and but don't really want to support our residents in our communities if they they objecting to it. what what can we tell them what you know in support of the hmos you know, we've reassured them, as I said, that, you know, those that we would look to put in there would have either little or no support needs whatsoever. But as I said, the, the public perception, as soon as you use that hatred of homelessness, they see you and perceive what, you know, the worst case scenario. So what they probably see maybe within the town centre with those with the most complex needs who do have significant substance misuse issues. Um, and that's what they think are going there. I think it hasn't helped either that um, some information has, has uh, been brought to the residents in terms of some of the historic issues that we've had at HMOs. Um, some of them were aware of an incident that happened in, in Plymouth Street. I'm not sure why, because that shouldn't have been in the public domain. Um, so I think there's be, been a bit of maybe scaremongering by by certain, whether the residents or or whoever, but certainly the perception of it is incorrect. So, you know, we've reassured them, we've told them that the property has 24 seven, uh, you know, security CCTV there. There's access to a member of staff from um, D2 24 hours a day. Duncan has offered them his own personal um, mobile number, should there be any issues. Um, and, you know, that we will do as much consultation as they want. And if it does get planning um, consent, then we'll revisit them and sort of discuss a way forward then and work together on that. OK, thank you. I, I guess it's sorry. I mean, I'm going into questions yet and I'm talking, but I, I guess the issue is that there's private HMOs as well and, you know, they may be causing issues and it's not, you know, that doesn't reflect well on, on Duncan's you know, plans then going forward. I think as well, you know, we've learned from that, obviously, from our perspective, we know we've got to manage the mix well. And and perhaps, you know, when we started the HMO, it was a new model for us. Um, and admittedly, you know, they were one of two things that did go wrong. But I think we've learned from that as well. And in fairness, I think some of the complaints that we've seen, particularly with the one up in Tyne, um, in fairness, hasn't been down to the HMO. The people might just be passing the property um, and a stumbling, shall we say, and there's that automatic assumption that it's a drunk person or somebody under the influence coming from that property. And in many instances, you know, it's not. And um, there's also property next door to the one in town where there's a lot of fly tipping in the back. And again, when you pass it quickly, it does look like it's coming from the HMO, but it's not. Um, and obviously, I've advised her invite mental health colleagues on that to see if there's anything they can do in terms of that because it is an empty property. So I think some of the public perceptions are a little bit unfair, if I'm honest. Okay, thank you. Chris? Yeah, so um, the, t the table at 12.3 um, of the report give, gives a little bit of a breakdown in terms of the, the 27 properties to date. Right? So it's been hard work, guys. We haven't got one over the finishing line, right? Uh, and we got one or two in... Um, in, uh, in town town ward, um, but that that is that is the state to play, and the data tells us, right, um, due to varying circumstances, that we are struggling with this part of our strategy, right? We really, really are, and we want to be honest with you. That's what scrutiny is for, isn't it? Right? Uh, is it going to get any easier? I doubt it. Right? I doubt it. Um, and I think we have to be mindful of officer time associated with this part of the strategy, right? Because it does take a lot of officer time um, to identify the property, go through the process, reach out, check out, you know, and sometimes on that journey, properties are getting sold quite quickly, right? So um, we just wanted to draw reference to that part of the report, right? And we need to take stock on that part of our strategy moving forward because it is becoming counterproductive, we feel, to the community, right? Because on one side of it, yeah, if we can get suitable properties for our clients, brilliant. But if, if that's causing disharmony in the community, then it's becoming counterproductive, isn't it? So we really need to take stock of that bit. Um, 
the the other part of the report just to just to finish off um is um <clears throat> just trying to be positive about the subject matter uh, more really and it's the 109 properties that we draw in reference to on 5.5.5 of the report so these are planned properties in in situ that that's part of our uh, yeah, 5.5. Let me just scroll to that part of the report, guys. Yeah, 5.5. Yeah, so those are part now of our schemes that are currently live, right? So <clears throat> what we are looking at, right, is, you know, developing a series of um, schemes um, with, our, with our strategic partners in, in nine areas predominantly in the north of Merthyr. Yeah, um, yeah, they are in the north of Merthyr. Now, that gives us, does give us a bit of fresh air, breath, fresh, fresh, a breath of fresh air, to be honest with you. It does, because we've got to see light at the end of the tunnel on this, definitely, right? And those 109 properties within budget, hopefully we'll be able to start to breathe coming up to 2022. Now, Will those under nine pop properties accommodate, right, the people in temporary accommodation? Some might, but don't think for a minute we're going to flip the numbers you see in one of the tables um, on page four into those properties because it's not going to work like that, right? Um, and for reference, the the numbers you see at four in temporary accommodation, that was a picture of the 29th of October. We've got an extra cohort on top of that now. So numbers are going north, right, in temporary accommodation. So we are going to carry out an, um, a kind of a matching exercise in terms of clients and how many of those clients are going to actually transpire into the 109 homes, right? It's not going to be anywhere near uh, a, a perfect match. Now, as we documented in the report, properties we are exploring are places like Liz Vane, and Marsh House. Now those those particular properties, and Marsh House in particular, we are hoping that they will absorb some of the some of the temporary accommodation people, in particular that are in B and Bs. So that's our thinking. That's our thinking at the moment. Um, and as I say, we've gone into a little bit of detail on these notions in in the report. I don't think there's anything else um, I'd like to delve into. I don't know whether uh, Suzanne or Suze or Alan have got anything to contribute to what we spoke about. Um, mm -hmm. um, we're happy to answer any questions or receive any comments. Yeah, plus before Kev comes in um, as the as the portfolio member, <clears throat> it goes back to some of the uh, some of the comments uh, that I made at the start of this. Um, Obviously, we've got these additional statutory obligations which have been placed on on all local authorities in Wales. It started to begin the COVID, and obviously, um, we now accommodate anyone who presents as as homeless. Yeah, and you've, we've all seen these numbers increase and increase. Probably the complexity, of the problem, um, as Susie was discussing uh, with myself and Chris, at the end of last week, is getting a bit different now. We're starting to see families, more than single people, starting to present, which gives us an even bigger headache in in, in actually the diversity of uh, of temporary accommodation into a uh, permanent accommodation that we're actually looking at. A lot of these additional presentations are coming from um, the the fact that the um, the ban on on evictions uh, by private uh, rented landlords that's now finished. Plus a lot of landlords with the with the property market uh, being being very very buoyant, they're cashing in their uh, their money and selling up. So you've got um, unintentional uh, um, uh, um, evictions actually happening. Now we've got plans. We've got we, we, we've got late, medium to to long term plans, but you can't just you can't just conjure accommodation out of the out of the air. Our problem, which is my problem, uh, because I have a statutory responsibility to report to yourselves as members, is that the only the only short term solution that we have is the uh, is the one that we've put forward, 
which unfortunately has proved very unpopular and is not working and is basically wasting our time. Um, and that is um, private sector HMOs uh, using partner organisations. So I've got a report to scrutiny that at this point in time, this authority is not meeting its statutory responsibility in relation to the two changes for, 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 the, for, for the existing housing regulations. Obviously, we, we're going to have to look at an alternative because the plan we've got in place isn't working. Um, we're looking at almost uh, a supported hostel type model in the in the right places. But again, that's that's not going to happen overnight. You know, these these type of schemes, they revenue hungry and obviously they uh, they also take some time. So that's where we find ourselves at the moment, and that's why we were really keen on uh, on having this discussion in scrutiny because it's a it's a dilemma. It's a dilemma for us as officers. It's a dilemma for the community, and it's a very very real dilemma for this council. Thanks, Alan. Um, before we go to questions, Kevin, do you want to come in? Yeah, I just want to raise a, a couple of points. One of a historical perspective, uh, not long ago I was first elected, I got involved with Duncan from D2. Um, he, he's, um, he's, he's, he's a good guy. He's, uh, he's, he's genuine, but it's uh, he's, he's, he's a bit of a vocation with him in relation to this work. But I first went to see one of his properties down in Newport, which was dealing with um, asylum seekers. Now, there was a criteria for the property. I think asylum seekers as well, and... This, this is just my belief, maybe not pro as problematic as some of the homeless. Um, and I met quite a few of them. They were in their rooms there. It was in a high turnover rental area. It was generally a pine end. Uh, it was um, nowhere near any schools. Um, it was near some shops and hopefully near a transport link that would take them to the centre. So that doesn't actually transfer ideally to our geographical situation. That's the first thing. And bearing in mind, the client group there were um, asylum seekers. I know we had different properties across Wales. Um, the other thing as well is I, I, I took on that and I was keen to, to sort of set a precedent and we, we had to in our, our ward and I was actively involved with that. But it does take some involvement from the local member as well, because you're actually right. A lot of the stuff that was Suzanne was saying, a lot of it was about perception and not about what actually went on there. In the truth with Plymouth Street, most people didn't know anything had gone on in Plymouth Street for two years until we had the occasion where there was a firearms incident there and then it all came to light then. Um, so I just wanted to give that as a little bit of a background. Um, I just think in our condensed cheek to jowl uh, communities, it's difficult to keep one of those going. And, you know, we've got lots of other types in our ward, particularly in Upper Thomas Street, Lower Thomas Street, Cortland Terrace, all these areas around the, the town centre. We've got quite a lot there. The other point I wanted to make in conversations with the team this week and a couple of weeks is that um, I was quite surprised how many things are coming down the track, how many solutions we've got. And I think there's a, it'd be useful for this committee to have some sort of representation of that sequencing in the future. We have a group of people at the moment, and it's interesting, families are getting involved now. So what does that customer base, if I can use that term, look like in detail? Um, what are the solutions, the options that we've got? And these are increasing because there's a massive amount of work going on and maybe some sequence in timelining of when these come on tap. Because unfortunately, we've got that problem base, 157 representations, and we haven't got that solution on tap at the moment, the quick quick turnover, and bear in mind it only gives us a handful, is the, the HMOs. They are quick turnover. They can turn over a property in, I think, about six weeks, something like that. It's, it's very quick turnover. But the long-term solutions, like March House, are unfortunately a little bit down the line. And it's for this committee to understand what that looks like. And I think we're working on something, um, physical representation, that kind of uses that, um, that timeline. That's all it was, Chair. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Kev. I um, yeah, I just um like to open it back up to uh, questions, Malcolm. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair. Uh, just a quick one for Alan. Um, you you said we're no longer meeting our statutory requirements under the under the legislation. Are there any legal ramif ramifications for the council for this? 
And uh, are other local authorities in a similar situation? Uh, yeah, there's um, a lot of authorities are probably in the same situation. Um, ultimately, obviously, uh, we could be referred to Welsh government, and they'd have to they'd have to decide on what action that um, was appropriate uh, that we haven't taken, because we 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 creatures of statute local authorities. We're given statutory responsibilities, which um, basically is is what we are for. So the expectation by the regulators uh, in this instance, uh, Audit Wales, is to make sure that we meet in all those statutory obligations at this point in time. And then we, well, we're pretty much there that we're not doing it because we're not making available the accommodation that we need to uh, to undertake a statutory undertakings. Okay. Malcolm, okay, thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, anybody have any questions? John? Yeah, thanks, Lee. Uh, well, it's just with regards to the, well, more so the one that we got in our ward, in the town ward, the one on the toy nail there. Uh, what I'd like to ask Suzanne, if uh, what sort of monitoring situations has he upgraded in any way? Of of monitoring the, the premises, not not at the time. One now, if we take a new one on, I'm talking about because the problems we had in time, like I was getting contacted twelve o'clock, one o'clock in the morning with the problems. And fair play, fair play to both the Susans. So I email them or ring them, and they would solve the problem. But to ring the number to get all the Duncan all security was non-existent. There was just nobody answering. So I just want to know what he's going to put in place to make sure that they can be contacted 24-7, basically, you know. Yeah, to be honest, we're not aware of there being any issues with the, the out of hours number. So for any new ones, um, there would still be that out of hours service. Um, and Duncan has, has also um, offered his own personal number. So in terms of what's available at the property, there would still be CCTV internally and external. And then they normally put the number which is available for anyone to ring then outside of the, of the properties, like on a plaque. Um, but as I said, we're not aware of any issues with, with um, people responding on that number. So, you know, if that has been an issue or is in the future, then please let us know straight away. Yeah, it was an issue for me. That's why I say that's why I was getting in contact with you when on the Monday morning, because obviously you can't contact yourselves on the weekend. Ringing that number then and nobody couldn't get through. I couldn't even get through, you know, and uh, it's just got to be made uh, sure that they, they are going to answer those phones and that, you know, because yeah. that's what causes the but problems. It should be available 24 seven. We've also got our out of our service as well for any emergencies. So if anyone rings our lifeline number, we've always got a housing member of staff on call 24-7. So if you can't get through on that number, then obviously th th they can go through to them as well to pick yeah. up any issues. I think if I can just pick up, I know I know there was one instance, um, Councillor Thomas, where, where we had a conversation and there was there was an issue um, of one evening. Um, and I, I know the prior... Um, the officer had actually left and given Duncan short notice. So I don't know why Duncan's number was, wasn't was available, but he, he has recruited since. And now he does utilise a pool of, of, of staff from the works and other authorities as well. So that, that problem should now be alleviated. Yeah, that's fine. Great. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, Gareth? Yeah, thanks, Lee. Um, the, the consultation process via the planning system is it's quite limited. There's only a, a small number of properties a contact or households rather are contacted. From what I understand, after the planning application, if, if that gets approved, there's then a consultation, a wider consultation with residents. Is that correct? Yeah, what we normally look to do then is obviously widen it, like you say, a bit further and broader than what planning would do. Um, obviously, it doesn't mean to say Duncan would knock every door in the estate, but certainly more broader than what planning would do. Okay. Because, you know, obviously, if, if planning was agreed, 
Um, that doesn't mean to say that we would have to proceed with it. Obviously, we bear in mind um, any objections raised um, as part of our uh, housing consultation then. OK, and how how long is that consultation likely to last? And, you know, how, how do you how do you consider how many properties need to be con contacted? I suppose that's done on a case by case basis, really, depending on the location of the property and, you know, how many properties are around it. But we'd certainly visit those that are in the immediate vicinity then. I suppose the one in, in Antikoi that we referred to, obviously we'd probably look at doing maybe three or four doors either side and the properties to the rear um, and those that are immediately adjacent to it. OK, thanks. And can I can I just touch on the... Can I jump in there for a sec? Yeah, um, go on. Just, just before we move on, um, this... This consultation from a housing perspective is, is completely voluntary and outside any statutory process. What we could have done is Duncan could have just gone through the staff agree um, planning process to buy a HMO on the agreement that it, it had exclusive use for our clients. But what we agreed, and uh, as Councillor Neil said, it was based on the early developments in the town ward. And I think we went, uh, I think we went a council actually at the time to say that, look, this is what we want to do. We want to take elected members and the community with us because we're working with a trusted partner. So we're not just going to rely on the statutory planning process for um, for, for delegated authority to, to, to create an HM board, which, you know, lots of people do in the private sector anyway. We're going to go over and above. Now, in going over and above, um, we seem to have um, let the cat out the bag a bit and people's perceptions, especially around perceptions in COVID around the client group in the town centre, has sort of coloured all this. So, you know, this isn't just a sort of problem with staff degree uh, responsibility, which is on elected members. I mean, we're all in this. We can't move the problems on. And you can't move the problems on as councillors. So we really are caught in a catch-22 um, based on the fact that we agreed to go through a voluntary process, which is addition, in addition to the statutory planning process. Thanks, Ali. Chris? And, and further to that, the question I'd like to ask scrutiny members, you know, well, do you have any thoughts and ideas for solutions? Right, because we, we, we've, hit, we've hit a bit of a brick wall, guys, with a lot of this, right? And, you know, I'd like to bring some solutions that we can try to resolve together, right? Um, so that's my question, Chair, to the group, is, you know, ideas, solutions, you know, what 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 can we do better, you know? Um, so that's what I'd like to ask, uh, Chair, if that's OK. Yeah, well, that's, that's a fair question. Well, I had one of my questions on what can, what can the committee do to support housing going forward? I, I We have discussed doing some co-production in the past and I need to chase up with Aunt, me and um, Maria will chase that up with Andrew and maybe if we can kickstart that again and with the RSLs and, and Duncan or whoever else and I think that would that would be the plan. Um, I'm conscious, um, Gareth, you've got you've got a, still got another question you want to ask. Yeah, thanks Lee. I, I just want to touch on um, how the local authority establishes who are housed at the HMOs um, and what criteria is used? OK, ultimately, we obviously look at the the, the, the risk for the individual initially, because um, as I've said before, we're not looking to put anyone with any complex needs in these properties, nor high risk offenders um, or anyone with any significant substance misuse or mental health condition. It is for those that have got low or no support needs. Obviously, we look at other matching in terms of sort of age, maybe other um, known information that we have on that individual. So there's no set criteria that we tick in a box, but those are generally the things that we will look at. Uh, maybe whether they work in, what the housing history has been. So it's it's a combination of things, really. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Suzanne. That's, that's, that covers everything. Thank you. Thanks, Gareth. Um, Mark, I'm your agenda, but 
Yeah, that Gareth's covered it there. Thank you very much. All right, no problem. Um, in terms of um, private HMOs, do, do we know how many there are up there in, in Merthyr? I couldn't. I, I couldn't tell you off the off the top of my head. But um, when you say HMO, um, it's people always think of a negative thing. Lots of people and families who who work live in housing. Uh, Houses and multiple op 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 occupation. The all it means is accommodation which is sh shared with other individuals or, or, or other families. And obviously, with uh, with affordability over the last couple of years, it's quite an attractive model. We worked with some private um, businesses who've cr who who've created some very um, very attractive property which are classed as HMOs because the multiple occupation of a building, but it's quite common. It's uh, it, it, it's surprising, Councillor Lewis. Uh, yeah, it, it was me asked the question, but I, I let you off. Uh, okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, the um, yeah. Only that the, there was one in um, in in my ward recently that um, and they had to apply uh, for planning. So I, I I thought that it would be something. That would have to go through planning, and I'd just not be a house with with families within within there. I you know going on what Chris said earlier, maybe doing some comms around what an HMO is, and and you know and all of these things that Suzanne just said of what we likely to put. I know it goes out when we do a, find a property and consult with the local community, but maybe prior to that, this is what an HMO is. This is where we are with the housing. These are the issues we have, and across Merthyr, and 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 maybe do some positive comms on on what a HMO looks like. It's an idea. Um, Hilary. Um, yes, I was going to say I don't know whether my question is a bit of a niche question, and um, I really appreciate that this is a weighty report in terms of need, complexity, detail, impact on staff. Um, but I just wanted to flag essential workers such as healthcare professionals and. I don't know whether this falls under any of the statutory duties, but you know I'm aware there's limited provision on hospital sites. That isn't always suitable, particularly for families. And I note paragraph 13.4 uh, refers to the private rental market, three bed homes and an affordability issue. Well, clearly for employed healthcare professionals, that affordability issue isn't an issue. The issue is availability um you know supply and demand etc um i recognize this is an issue across wales uh but actually it may impact on the ability of individuals to take up roles or stay in our area so i just wondered you know it, um does the health board and the work with the local authority or sorry the local authority work with the health board on this um or what could the committee comment on that on provision for essential workers? Um, it's an ongoing discussion with the health board because on several occasions we've discussed with the health board about additional accommodation for Prince Charles Hospital, as an example. Obviously, they've got their own residential provision up there. Um, but normally a lot of the health workers actually use private rented accommodation or HMOs. Um, especially relevant, not so much now, but especially relevant for overseas uh, staff who are, who are new to the area. So it is very topical, uh, Hilary, um, and something which is a constant consideration and a constant discussion between ourselves and the Comtaf Morgano Health Board. OK, thank you. Yeah, that's great to know you're in touch with them. Like, obviously, there's, there's, there's lots of flats within um, Prince Charles. I, I know some of them did get turned into offices a few years ago, so I, I don't know if they have the, the full capacity as um, as they once would have. Um, but it's good to know that um, you're in, in touch with them. Um, has anybody else got questions? I, I've got I've got one. Oh, well, I've got multiple. But, um, is is around. Chris, on page twelve, um, you said about the the hundred, is it hundred and nine houses? I think it was or accommodation. Um, this it says the following schemes are currently live in our main program. Um, what what does live mean, and where where are we with with these developments? Chris. 
Chris, you're on mute. So I was just saying for Sue's to come in, it's on site too, isn't it? Commissioned a contract, isn't it? Yeah, so the, the um, development programme that we manage um, is the grant that we historically had around 1.4 million for to develop social social housing, supported accommodations, etc., and general needs and adapted stock. So in terms of the, the programme that we have, we have a um, live programme, which is all of the ones that have been through scrutiny and, and been approved by Welsh Government uh, and are, in tra are on train, really. So, so they've started, there's been some spading ground, the planning's approved, there's some work ongoing. Um, and, and that's what we mean by live. And then we have reserve and potential for any schemes that we're developing, but that there may not be enough grant yet, and um, that there may be some um, initial sort of development and remediation of land before they can be assessed for, for relevance for residential development, etc. So those are the schemes that would have been approved by Welsh Government and that are either um, working, spading ground now, or, or are just about to. Okay, thank you for that. Um, uh, so you chair the other point to that, as you said, in 5.5, um, it's not a monopoly for MVH and MTHA. You know, Harvard have come to the table recently, right, which is good. I think competition is good, right? Um, and hopefully we can develop, we have a relationship with them anyway, um, as you do with Pobble. Um, so hopefully the RSL base will grow so it becomes more competitive to the market, really. And I think that's that's... That should be encouraging moving forward, I think, Chair. Great. Um, going on, going on um, those developments, Walnut Way, um, four units of accommodation, um, just to update you, um, MVH sent a letter out saying they were going to only build two properties now. Um, I've met with residents. I, I, I you know, I, I've, I've given my views on this development i think when when we're discussing with the rsls about choosing areas to to develop there are other spaces within our communities that would lend itself better to um to developments um just discussing on this is a, this is in a built-up area which obviously you know the space um and then they they are building on a small bit of land where children play and it is it, quite difficult um, for us to support these developments when they're on small parcels of green space in already a built up area. So maybe discussions with with, our, with members that might be a way forward as well. If you're asking what we could do to support you guys. Um, there's also uh, in 6.2, it says about the honeysuckle, the passive property, the passive houses. When it says September, early October to be completed, is that next year? No, it was it was envisaged to be done um, by this year, um, but unfortunately, we've seen delays across the whole construction industry due to um, the post-COVID effects of price increases, availability of contractors. Um, and, and unforeseen work. So um, I believe that's been extended now until February. So we're expecting a, a February 2022 completion. So we can send an update on that. Um, and just for me to update members, there have been some slight changes to the to the figures here. So as as um, Councillor Davis quite rightly pointed out, Walnut Way has been decreased to two to allow the um, continuation of, of that green space really um, in response to the community consultation and also um, the Penland guest house at Cortland Terrace, the sale has now ceased. However, we are looking to pick that back up with a potential of 10 units rather than six. So we could be seeing an additional two units if we can take that development forward. Um, so we, we do continually update these statistics. So we're happy and um, we do a, a, a six weekly sort of highlight report with the key data and key stats of where we move in. Um, and I think what's um, come out of some of the more recent meetings is, is matching what, who we see going into these properties and how, how much of the homeless cohort we can support within these. So we're happy to provide that as part of a highlight report going forward as well. Well, I, well, I got a little bit of an update from Merthyr Valley's homes earlier regarding the passive homes. Um, and it, it just said um, uh, that they're waiting for the SAB, the drainage, um, and they'll, you know, hopefully start before the end of the financial year. And that's just a start. Um, so that's like quite a significant delay, I guess. 
before they were complete. I, I, once once they start, I guess they they don't take long to put in situ. But um, yeah. Um, okay. Anybody else got any questions? I I have a couple more. Uh, bear with me. Um, in terms of um, the hardship fund. Um, coming to an end next year um, and based on the report, if we don't start reducing numbers in temporary accommodation, is there a danger that um, there'll be a budget deficit? And um, obviously we discussed earlier, meeting our statutory duties. Yeah, it's quite, um, our forecast is quite substantial. Um, Without the without the hardship fund, the way it's currently going, then uh, probably we'd be overspent on this current uh, this current budget uh, between, I'd probably say two point two and two point eight million. I did draw lots of crying faces in different places in the report, but uh, yeah, that's a significant uh, deficit. Um, you know, it says. Welsh Government advised that this funding will end. Is there any discussions to see if it will continue? Yeah, the jury's out at the moment. Um, it was it was un, it was uncertain whether or not it would continue to it, but it looks like that's the case. I think uh, Susie and Chris can confirm that. The big fear we've got is if we have uh, a good settlement, Welsh Government will say, well, they why you've got a good settlement, the money for the money for the homelessness temporary accommodation provisions in your settlement. In which case it's another way you're saying you're gonna pay for it. Yeah. I'm guessing, you know, the, the period between Christmas and and uh, end of the financial year is a good time for funding. You know, fingers crossed that that'll be a period where they'll say, right, you okay. Yeah. Some surplus that we got to cover that. Um in discussions uh we've we've had um previously uh around homelessness um do we i think it's in 4.8 it says 12 um individuals may be currently homeless is, is that the correct figure it says eight individuals were unable to accommodate uh, in temporary accommodation due to them having exhausted all options available and a further four who have uh, lost a placement and are waiting for alternative temporary accommodation. Is, 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 is Are they rough sleepers? Yeah, some of them are rough sleepers, um, although they're not verified and some are known to be living with other individuals and, and so for surfing. The number is slightly lower now because we have been um, successful in getting one back into hostel accommodation. But, you know, that is the number that, um, as you say, have, have been offered temporary accommodation, but have lost it generally through behaviour and literally we can't accommodate them anymore. OK, you know, thanks. Thanks, Susan. Going back to uh, 4.3, everybody in, you know, um, Welsh Government doesn't recognise um, homeless shelters. Is that, is, am I reading that right? Yeah. So, yeah, it's still the view that um, we, we're not to entertain any form of um, shared facility accommodation, including any night shelter or floor space. OK, so what happens if somebody wants to be uh, a rough sleeper? It is going to be very challenging this winter because, um, as we've already stated, our uh, B&B is at capacity. And basically, we are going to have to rely on the goodwill of the proprietors, giving them a second chance. Um, or looking at additional B and B um, out of borough, but I know other local authorities are approaching us for exactly the same reason. So realistically, that's probably not going to be an option. So you know, it is a high risk that we're not going to be able to offer any accommodation if our cold weather plan is triggered. Okay, but say an individual wants to remain rough sleeping. You know, the minister is saying everybody in. But like you know, there may be certain individuals that like that lifestyle. Um, you know, how do we report on that? And I suppose this is the challenge. We, we do fortnightly report the figures to Welsh government, so they will be aware of those that we have rough sleep in. Um, but similarly, um, you know, those that we've got in B and B at the moment, 
Welsh Government are obviously promoting a, a rapid rehousing model going forward. But uh, I think, you know, there needs to be some sort of understanding that not all of our homeless cohort actually want accommodation, as difficult as it is for, for us to understand that. I think, you know, if we were just to offer a B&B room for many on a long term basis, many would be happy with that going forward. So, you know, it's, it's not a one size fits all. OK, thank you. I've got a you know, concerns around, uh, you know, the B&Bs, you've, you've got a, an agreement until the end of March. Come come then, they want to go back to the, their model. But what do, what do we do? That's probably a bit of an answers on a postcard, I think, really. As we've said, you know, we have paid for a lot of the B&B up to the end of March. Um, that's not all, though, not the ones that are out to borough. Because um, obviously we need permission from the housing department in those localities to place there anyway. But certainly, you know, there's no contract in place. So it is a realistic possibility that come sort of 1st of April, they could turn around and say, you know, we, we want our rooms back. Um, and basically we would be in a almost mm. impossible situation of having to rehouse potentially 93 households. Which brings us, which brings us back, you know, without, without darking on about our staff responsibility, but the law and the regulation currently says that the authority has staff responsibility to find these individuals accommodation so they're not on the street. So if the worst came to the worst and the castle hotel wasn't available from um, from next week, then we'd have a huge cohort of people that we could do nothing with. Yeah, and that, that's the that's the big risk here, isn't it? Right, in that. So you look at the Castle Hotel, right? Um, it's quite a lucrative business for him at the moment, isn't it? <laughs> when you when you think about it, right? Um, and <clears throat> so, and I mentioned that in the context of it being a hotel, right? And B and B. Now we've always carried the high stock of TAs, and that stock has always been hovering between sixty and seventy sous, isn't it? Right, and it's always been some of our BBs have always accommodated some of these clients, right? And pre-pandemic, were we happy with that? Not really, right? Because our tourism agenda really should be buoyant enough to get day visitors to stay in Merthyr Tydfil more. Right, so it is a it is a bit of a conundrum. This isn't it. In that, yes, we want to grow the tourism market. We can't at the moment because we got 170 people in the B and Bs. So someone's got to give you, isn't it? Someone's got to give. Other, otherwise, it's going to be a gridlock, and it is gridlock now, isn't it? Right, and we do run the risk. That's why we put in the summary of the report. We have become over reliant on the B and Bs. Right, and that's pre-pandemic in my in my in my mind. So that's why our exit strategy in in terms of identifying um, properties that are far more suitable than places like the Castle Hotel has to be front and centre, isn't it? It's got to be. So that's why you know places like Marsh House, given that as an opportunity, is the priority building that we got to land. Right, and that's only going to that's only going to take what between twenty and thirty people says realistically. If we if we lucky, right? Um, so it's still okay. It's a, it's a dent in the one seventy, but we're a million miles away, guys, and we being realistic. So that's why we need this diversity of accommodation, yeah. and the only reason that we pursued this um, private uh, uh, a private HMO. With um, uh, with the trusted provider was to give us that diversity, but obviously with the with the issues that we've uh, we've hit, then that's taken a big chunk of our our strategic approach away, and this is why we're struggling. So we need to bounce back now to this uh, to this supported hostel accommodation model, which there's only very few buildings in Merth that could accommodate, and. You never know when we when we do actually um, hopefully land the deal and secure the finance for Marsh House. Um, obviously, that's not going to go down very well. 
in the uh, in the local community. We can have a repeat performance of the um, of what we see in currently in the way that dispersed stock. It's just a very difficult situation. Um, it's extremely difficult for members. I you know really really appreciate we really appreciate it. Equally as um, um, as difficult for us as officers because it currently is the only solution we can put forward in the in the short term. Not ideal, but it's the only model that we can actually do. I think Kevin at the at the nail on the head. Councillor Neil earlier. Ruth is a small place, isn't it? Um, everyone knows what's happening. Everyone knows what's going on to a certain extent, and no, you were you were constit you were constituents, and I'm proud, and probably lots of individuals in the community don't want one of these facilities for whatever reason in their street. Yeah. Agreed. You know, you speaking with the community over the neighbourhood learning centre was evident, and you know the feelings, and you know that that that's taken some some talking to, and you know even though it's really positive, it's, I still got to listen to the community members and how they feel as well. So, um, Andrew, evening, afternoon, um, guys. Um, so just I've got I've just got two quick questions, um. First of all, four point referring to 9.1 and 9.5 about the neighbourhood learning centres you just mentioned there, Lee. Um, about the, so it's fantastic that they've been awarded with £750,000 for funding for these blocks for five um, accommodate 16 to 24. And um, from a young people's perspective, that's actually some really good news to hear that um, for these pupils which are leaving sometimes secondary education a secondary school um maybe these pupils might be neat pupils as well we're not too sure that's really good to hear but i'm just um asking the question of is there any update on um the two hundred thousand pounds over budget um which is a 9.5 is there any um information we've got on that yeah, um, I can pick that up. Um, so the original um, cost plan was around £742,000 um, pre-pandemic um, construction costs. So um, with some additional um, looking at the works required and some additional work to landscape and really make sure that we invest in the surroundings of the building, so we're investing in the wider community, the budget has gone up by 221000 now to 963000 So we are in the process of... Um, speaking to our funders to see whether there's any additional funds that we can take over we've had to actually move the whole scheme from this financial year to a little bit this financial year and the majority into ne next year um so we, we're drafting well i'm drafting a letter after this meeting today to provide an update with an ask that if there's any additional funding we would like to um apply and, and be be um supported by any slippage funding um, and we've also um thankfully through through alan and conversations with steve we we have some underwritten um funds from core capital money should that not happen so so the scheme will happen um and the likelihood is we'll, we'll attract um some further um integrated capital funding um but but it is underwritten by our core capital so so the project will will continue fantastic thank you suzanne thanks andrew um one question. I, I I think me and you, Chris, have maybe discussed this about the the Lumacari module um, in Stoke. Um, is that something that potentially that, no? Ali Shaker is that no? We'd ever look at. Welsh Welsh government probably wouldn't go with it, Lee. Okay. I, you know, it seems to be, you know, what, what I've seen there, it, it works really, really well. Everybody's got their own postcode and address and everything. Um, yeah, I just look, looking at options as well um, and looking at models that that happen outside of maybe Wales and what they do in other areas. Yeah, Chris might want to elaborate on this, but uh, our, our, our last conversation is it probably wouldn't be uh, a runner with WG. No, and, and, and I think um, I've been in some regional meetings where um, I think models, it wasn't a Lou Macari model, it was similar where they used um, uh, industrial space really in terms of pods within. And 
you know, I, I think Lou McCarry's done really, really well around that. I happen to think that um, because of his profile, right, he's been able to attract, you know, significant funding and his personality and his linkages and everybody wanted to be part of it. Um, there's been very little appetite recently for to mirror that type, type of model. Um, and very tepid from WG to be to be honest. Um, would it work? Would it work in Merthyr? Um We got some reason size industrial units. Um, I'm just trying to think. No, nah, we there was very little appetite for it, uh, and without without the funding to convert, I think it, from WG it just wouldn't 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 work, guys. You'd have um, you'd have Suzanne then doing the same consultation on industrial estate only with that uh, with that tool sectors on businesses yeah and I, and I think that that's a fair point isn't it in terms of uh, businesses are quite protective of their own small patches on key industrial sites throughout throughout the county borough um, I guess you know we we run into all sorts of problems and really. Okay, thank you. Um, my last question is just around um, Kim Mill and um, the traveller site there. Um, all positives from there? Yeah, are they engage everybody engaging? Yeah, in terms of the site itself, um, we're looking at a, a capital programme now with Welsh Government um, for a phase two to do some work around the infrastructure um, and a full refurb of the 24 plots. So we're in the process of setting up um, a presentation with Capita, who are designing that for us um, with Welsh Government um, over the next coming weeks. Um, and I believe we've submitted an application or about to any time now for that funding which is looking at in anywhere in the region of half a million to three quarters of a million thereabouts. In terms of the site itself, for from phase one funding, we've done a bit of work up there in terms of putting um, new shutters on the community centre. We put um, new hookups on the this, each plot. We've also um, installed dual water and electric um, prepayment meters to all the plots. Um, that has come to a shock as a shock to some residents. Um, because whereas previously the council were invoicing them for their uh, water, um, now it's on a prepayment basis. So obviously they they are having to um, actually meet the cost of that, which, uh, as I say, has come a bit of a shock, particularly now that the, the weather's uh, getting a bit colder. But all in all, it is um, working well. Um, I don't think we've got any vacancies now on the, on the site um, and everything's going good, touch wood. Great, thank you. Just out of interest, do, do they pay like council tax? How, how does it and um, rent? How, how, how does it? How, how does it work? They pay. Um, we charge them for for the plot, um, which is covered in many cases by housing benefit. They also pay for the the caravans themselves then for the plot, um, and they do pay council tax. Obviously, if they're eligible for um, reduction, council tax reduction, which many are then they wouldn't actually pay it, but uh, they, they are liable generally. OK, great. Thank you. Um, um, if it, oh, Chair, once we, um, once we foolproof the master plan at the, at the future scrutiny in 2022 now, I guess, we perhaps we can, we can share the details of the site plan. Um, we have an aspiration to make it the best site in Wales. So that's Lily Bramley's aspiration whether the budget from Welsh Government affords us to do that. But the master plan is in phases and I think total costs are 2.4, 2.5 million. So um, I think we've gone from, um, I think, uh, responding to opportunities from Welsh Government in piecemeal to develop a master plan that's in phases, right? And that's, that's the difference, I think, really, that we're trying to instill in Welsh Government like that. So we'll have a plan on the shelf that we'll be able to draw down components of, feeding it directly into Welsh Government. So it'll take a couple of years, right, uh, with, without a doubt, um, because I think the, the I think what were we told, Sue, I think the budget pan Wales is only just over 3 million, right, for these sites. So we've got to be realistic in terms of our quarter for Merthyr. They've asked us to come in for a bid of half a million. So we're a fifth of the way there, 
right? And we'll keep chipping away at our strategy and on developing the site out. But the plans look really encouraging. Oh, I, I wouldn't mind the visit if it, you know, yeah. if they'll accept me to go up. But maybe they can be part of um, the CRF project going forward as well. So, um, yeah. so um, OK, any, Malcolm? Yeah, just to, just to follow on, on from that, Lee, um, how engaged are the residents with the council? Are they fully on board with the master plan? Suze? We haven't done any um, formal consultation with them at the moment um, because the, the site coordinator is um, on sick leave at the moment. Um, but I think there's been minimal consultation in terms of um, the development of the actual utility blocks, but uh, further consultation will be done with them in due course. And obviously it's great news for them because they're quite looking forward to having uh, the refurbs done. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of the ideas, uh, Malcolm, are born out of their desires, right? So utility blocks, community centre, there's Lily's got some exciting plans for community engagement. Um, there's there's a, a, a middle part of the land that um, there's a play component for young people going to go in there. So a lot of the foundations that have been born of the master plan have actually come from residents. Um, but as Suzanne's rightly said, until we get till we we get a, a broad idea of master plan v cost v timeline, we want to make sure we take in incrementally to the residents the stages. So they don't think they're getting three three million pound or two million pound all in one hit. So it's got to be balanced. It's got to be balanced. Um, the ways um, we we said in air is running. No, that's that's good to hear. Um, it sounds really exciting plans you got for the site. Um, I didn't know that a community centre, so that's uh, interesting to hear as well. Yeah, if I can just, um, this has sort of got under the radar because it's work in progress. But um, when the when the housing team and Chris actually took over the management of the site and we brought uh, we brought the lease back into the into the local authority. I mean, it's been totally transformed. Um, obviously, through COVID, we haven't been able to tell the uh, the story, uh, Lee and Mark. Um, but it really is, it, it really is quite a remarkable story of uh, of transformation. I, I think it's somewhere I might retire to. The sound of it, plans for it. I have. <laughs> it's just one question: Is there? Um, Chance of development further more than twenty four plots there, or is that like less capacity? Mm. Um, I think from what we know of that site, it's pretty, it's pretty tight to twenty four, yeah. right? It, it is tight. I drive past it all the time. I've just never been, never been into it. So it will be interesting to go in. I'll speak to Lily. Is it Lily that's off at the moment? Yeah, yeah. I'll speak to her. Yes. Yeah. If you want to contact me, Chris, we can arrange uh, to go up there. That's, that's no problem. We are also due to do another Gypsy Traveller accommodation assessment um, by the end of February as well, which will identify any additional need for that community. Great. Yeah, um, to complete the story, we, we have a site warden. His name is Will Galaney. He's, he's a real character, right? As you can imagine, um, salt of the earth, really good guy. You know, um, I met him in the summer and it was a real experience. It really, really was. Right. So I'm sure members, you know, Lee, if you want to go up there, it's uh, it's a real experience. And to be honest, I really I really enjoyed it because like most members, you tend to fly past there and uh, you think, oh, what's that? And, and I, I remember Al meeting the previous owner a long, long, you knew I was going to mention that, Al. I remember meeting Craig a long, long time ago. And again, you know, sites are born out of these characters. Really, really are. But no, it's a great, great project. Alan is right. It's, so, it's been so understated. Um, I think it's been one of those projects come up, come on the radar pretty quickly. When you get funding, you can do lots and lots of things, really, can't you? And the site, the site warrants it without the shadow of a doubt, really. Yeah, you can get the funding, but it's it's not always spent wisely. But uh, it does does sound like it's a really good project. Um, any other questions from any councillors? No. Uh, any comments? 
I, I just like to thank you for this excellent report. Um, it's very honest. Um, and I like that, Chris, that you asked what, you know, what we could do. And I think if we, we really need to move on, maybe do some co-production and getting everybody together and, you know, try and, 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 you know, getting the public in and speaking to everybody and, you know, talking to them about the pressures that the local authority are under and, and coming up with ideas of what, how we can help to, to solve these issues. Um, me and Maria will, will catch up with Andrew regarding that. Um, and maybe we can bring, do that in the next few months and maybe bring a report towards the end of, like maybe March or April, does that sound okay? Yeah, if, if look, if in early January you want to sit down and flesh out or scope out, you know, co-production workshop, you know, whether we want to um, just change the scrutiny format and we you know, pick a wicked issue and we walk you through and we demystify more of this agenda, right, or pocket or pockets of it and we explore potential solutions, I think we'd we'd welcome that. Um, and just break it up a little bit, and perhaps um, by doing that, I think we we'll 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 demystify the subjects a little bit more, really, and perhaps you never know ideas might be a little bit more free flowing, chair. I, well, I, that's the plan, um, Malcolm. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I feel for officers on this. You are between a rock and a hard place on this. There aren't going to be any easy solutions, but yeah, it would be good if perhaps we could get together and, and come to some ideas. Um, I was going to mention like the Lumakari project, but obviously that's a non-starter. But perhaps we can all get down together and, and come up with some ideas on it. Uh, Alan? Yeah, perhaps, uh, perhaps, Chair, we might want to um, have um, uh, another report based on the financial uh, implications uh, once we know more from Welsh Government, which will probably be in about January, uh, based on the settlement and further, uh, further information about the hardship fund. Um, and perhaps we can have a discussion outside outside this meeting about that because it, it, it might need to be a joint uh, joint committee discussion. Okay, yeah, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be for that. Um, Kev? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, a, a couple of things. We did, um, there's an overlap here with planning, and uh, what we came across in town ward is with a lot of HMOs of different descriptions, and we didn't know they were there, and we didn't know they were coming, but we picked up all the flack from the public. Um, that's why you'll see now that you all get told about planning, that you have the, the monthly, uh, or whenever the planning stuff, that's from that. I asked, could we have that? Um, the other thing as well is it really does put you right in the middle because you feel duty bound to try and help the public. So we had um, a workshop with the cabinet and I think it'd be worthwhile something for scrutiny to think about in relation to East Street, you know, the East Street issue with the, um, the cancer care centre and all that. We worked through that. We haven't completed it because we didn't go to the next phase where um, the planning committee were called upon to present a report, if you recall. But we did all the stuff beforehand because um, Declan found himself right in the middle of it all on that occasion. And it's very difficult if you don't want to be predetermined to actually feel that you're supporting your community. Um, the other thing I've got here is, I don't know if you can see it, it's the big issue about homelessness. It came out, I've kept it here, but there's a lot of vis different versions of the Lumakari model, right? So that's that's the other thing as well. And the nearest we are coming to it are these pods. The way we drop these pods in, that's more maybe along the lines that we could do something. It won't have the numbers, but it's given ownership and given a stable base to some of our, uh, well, I don't know if they're difficult customers, but they're homeless anyway, you know. So uh, I just want to bring it out the table. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Claire. Yeah, no, the uh, the passive houses are great. They just seem to be a very expensive option. Um, I, I suppose the benefit of them is that they, they can be picked up and moved if they don't work in certain areas, whereas uh, bricks and mortar can't. Uh, and you know, they're quite energy efficient, so that's a real positive. Um, anyway, I'd like to thank all the officers for attending today and presenting the report. I think it's been really, really good. Uh, the report was excellent. 
um, you're now welcome to leave and we'll catch up soon. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Chair. See you soon. Bye. Yes. Yeah, Bye. Take care. Right. Okay, who's left? Um, so moving on to um, agenda item four, um, community work program 2021-22. Maria, you mentioned that there may be another report. For the life of me, I can't remember what it was. That, yeah, that may need to be yeah. brought. Um, we've had a request from Paul Lewis, Head of Protection and Safety Services, um, asking whether a report could be brought before the committee in March of this year to look at the prevent and protect um, requirements which the council has to um, respond to. Um, at the moment, there's one item on the work programme. Um, so uh, I'm just checking to see whether committee members are comfortable. There are statutory requirements linked to this work, just to make you aware of that. But um, just to confirm if the committee are comfortable with me adding that uh, report to the work programme. It's fine with me. Everybody yeah. else okay? Yeah. Yeah, go with me, okay. Chair. Yeah, finally, yeah. fine. Thank you. Um, yeah. Maria, like, I know we touched on it just now. I think we, if we can touch base maybe next week about the the co-production stuff. Um, I've uh, recorded an action for us, Chair. I'll give you a call. All right, bro. Um, I may <laughs> bring another report towards the end of like April or, or March or April or whatever. Um, in terms of um, marches, we're um, I think we're asking new pathways to come back in um, mm -hmm. regarding doing a report on um, sexual violence. Um, have, have we done any work with them since? Do you know of officers? None of which I'm aware, but I'm happy to uh, go out to the chief officers to identify whether any connections have been made, and I can feed back to the committee that if uh, if that's of any use to you. Yeah, great, because it says where a committee requests a report to be presented um, to offer updates on progress progress made to date. You know, I, I don't know whether any has taken place and maybe we should start picking that up soon. No problem, I'll do that as soon as I can. Well, thank you. Um, anything else? Anyone? Uh, only under the work programme, just to check that everyone's comfortable. Uh, the report coming to the next committee meeting, 14th of December, is the second of three reports on um, EU funding and the implications uh, of that. So just checking whether anyone had any additional elements to that report so I can update the authors when I request the report from them. I guess... Um... Well, they, they, they've announced the obviously the, the CRF funding now, and I don't know whether they'll have any more details on the levelling up. And uh, well, it's just changing all the time, isn't it? Um, you know, it took them three or four months to to come up with the, the CRF past the deadline that, that they said they would set. They, well, it's the deadline they set themselves. So, mm. um, yeah, just an update on where we are with with the levelling up and the CRF and. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's it for the work programme. Lovely. Thank you, Chair. Um, and then uh, item agenda six, reflection evaluation of meeting. Um, I think it went quite well. Um, I thought it was a really good report. Um, I think it answered honestly. Um, it is a concern, obviously, I was in and homelessness. I think it's our number one thing for us to try and tackle at the moment. Everything, everybody think it went okay? Yeah, like I said, I think, you know, yeah. we're between a rock and a hard place, aren't we? We yeah. all know there's a need for the HMOs, but nobody wants them in their wards. So yeah. how we square that circle, I, I, I don't know. But perhaps if we can get together and come up with some other ideas. Yeah, I, you know, I think, yeah, like, like you said, Mark, I, th I think we, we all are, we, 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 we're all in a, between a, hawk, a rock and a hard place for me, because like, you know, we, we know there's a need and then we've got to listen to our community members at the same time. So it is really difficult. Okay. Hilary? Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, in terms of, for want of a better expression, a PR campaign around this, you know, 
people mentioned earlier that there are some good news stories coming out of this and the trouble is everybody in fact Kevin I think it might have been you everyone focuses on the bad I'm just wondering if they're without um invading on people's privacy because you well you have volunteers to do it you know I wonder is there a way around it to promote how well this is for individuals who are in these um in these um housing solutions you know it, it might just be a way to promote the positive I, I I agree. Like I said earlier, I think some positive comms around this would be really beneficial and demystify, as Chris says, you know, the issues. Um, we all think that you have a HMO and it's just going to be constant antisocial behaviour, but that's generally not the case. It could be it could be three working people in the hospital. We don't we, we don't know. Yeah, it could be. And I know, um, you know, we pride ourselves, don't we, in the valleys on our community spirit. Um, and I'm sure it would speak to lots of people who feel that way. It's just, a, you know, I heard a dreadful example of um, a young woman in her late 20s being verbally abused in town, um, really seriously verbally abused in town in broad daylight. And the word was that it was someone in, you know, um, a single person in a residence, etc., who was doing this. Um, I don't know whether it was or not. The particular area of the town, it could have easily been someone who came out of a pub. But that's what the story going around was. And, um, you know, it may or may not have been true. I just don't know. But I think some positive stories uh, to counter these negative ones um, could be a solution or part of a solution. It's, it's complex. I understand. If that. I can come in there, Chair, I think I think I think it's a good good idea that um, we've got a three pronged approach at the moment to the town centre. The, the first one is that we're getting money. We're getting a lot of money investment for properties, but also we've got a lot of money from the police commissioner in relation to the cameras and that sort of support. We've now got much more engagement from the police. You'll notice we've had an operation a month uh, doing uh, some work in the town centre. And also we're looking at possibly trying to move out the services from the high street. Marsh House is one of the examples where we, we're trying to get this away. But we do have a group of 15, 20 people who are highly disruptive in the high street and they're known to both of us. So this week we're going back in time to set up the community safety partnership where all the uh, proactive services, our proactive services, our environmental health, our community safety, police, town security, all that sort of thing are getting together. This was something that used to be, uh, it's legislated, but it used to be a very active about 15 years ago and look at how we look at these problems we're also looking at the type of groups we've got i mean what really concerns me is that we've got families now more than being homeless yet we spend a lot of time on some people who have, have had multiple chances and uh, we, we've, we've got to be honest about that as well and that's what i what i asked the um the the, the team this week about is that we had to be honest i didn't know until this week we had 27 options that have been turned away for HMOs because of my ward we've taken on two uh, and to be honest they've been problematic but because of the nature of them they're short stay so you have a group of people say three or four and you're looking for them to gain their confidence to get and to move on so as you think of that turnover clearly the odds are that every now and then you're going to get a bad egg mm. because that bad egg creates that that impression where we don't talk about the 10 or 12 went through it and we're great we end up talking about the bad egg and, and you know it's a difficult one um i i don't think the model maps into our community to be honest though when i think about when i went to newport and i went to barry and saw it was there those communities were very much rental communities big turnover a lot of diverse communities it wasn't like our town it's just too close in a lot of the time and if something goes wrong there that's it. It becomes the legend. And it's very difficult for an elected member to act in the middle of that, as I know to my own, <laughs> my own uh, regret. It's very difficult to act in the middle there, right? It's very difficult. And there's, I think there's a lot of training needed for, for elected members to deal with that issue. But I'm confident we can get it. And that's why I wanted something out there, sequencing, so we can say, look, this is where we are now. I think we're going to go through a little bit worse. But in the new year... Some of these places will come on tap and we'll start breaking it down. I'm confident, uh, certainly in 12 months' time, it'll be very, very different. 
I don't know what the legislation is going to be like. That that isn't particularly helpful, to be honest with you. But that's the way it is. Thanks, Kev. Um, like you said, though, you, you know, antisocial behaviour is a problem wherever you are. It, you know, it doesn't need an HMO to to have antisocial behaviour. We get it all the time within within communities. So, um, yeah, can we really want to come back in before I call Rebecca in? Yeah, it, it's just still on this point, really. For me, it's about relatability, isn't it? So these success stories, someone as a grandmother could relate to, well, that could be my grandson, look at the success he's made of his life, that could be my granddaughter, that could be my niece. It's that relatability, that's that empathy you want to get with people rather than walls up. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think in Merthyr we're not very good, um, sorry, this is a very general statement, at portraying the positive and the positive role models that we've got. You know, I can name numerous young people in Merthyr who've made a real success of their lives, but we don't seem to, I don't know what it is, we don't seem to always focus on that. And this is a really good opportunity to accentuate the positive and, and, and appeal to people that way. You know, that relatability is just is just so key to it, I would suggest. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and that's where we were going. That's the, that's the point we were trying to make with the Neighbourhood Learning Centre. You know, we I'm a, I'm a father, three children, and you know, if something happened to me and my wife, and there was there was something like that there available for them. You know, great. I want them supported, and I want, want them look after properly, and you know, providing a really good start in life. So it's, it's, it's people when they see lots, you know, supported living, they think, oh my God, what's going to come come here now? And it, you know, it is difficult. And I, I, you know, if it happened in my community, it, it might be a challenge for me. But you know, it is needed. Um, Rebecca. Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, just on this point, um, uh, so following on from what Holly, Hillary's saying, I, I agree totally about kind of like the positive PR needed. Um, I was just wondering, um, with the, those who are classified as homeless, um, is there any behavioural assessment made to determine there's the suitability for the various types of housing solutions. So if, if they have a behavioural assessment, then they are deemed suitable to go into this type of accommodation. And if they have this type of behaviour assessment, they go into that type. Does that happen at all? Yes. Yeah. I, 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 I can't. Kev, you might be able to talk a bit more than that. Yeah. Yeah. It uh, obviously looking from the negative out, if someone comes in with mental health issues and it's on record from, you know, that that would. And also if someone has a, a substance issues, those sort of things are all uh, taken into account. Now, some of it uh, I it would be on their actual record somewhere. Obviously, there's a police record. Yeah, but those things all come into um, what what they're looking to do is, is is match the housing need with that particular individual's needs, and we mm -hmm. we're all talking about the um, uh, the disruptive antisocial behaviour individual who may have a substance issue, but there's also those ones who who need a certain environment if they have a, a, a mental health issues. That's a lot more how can I say um, supportive, a wraparound service. Yeah, it's a difficult one to match, and and it isn't helped. By the fact that we've got a, it's clearly there's a number of people presenting who don't really need housing. They've chosen not to sleep on someone's sofa, and they've chosen to be in the castle hotel. And actually, they quite like it. They quite like that life. It's very comfortable for them. And in fact, we've got a number of people presenting saying we want to go to the castle hotel. I mean, <laughs> it kind of make you smile, haven't it? You know, but but that's where we are. How does how it seems a bit bizarre that people are able to establish that they want to stay in a hotel it just it seems really odd that that they have that luxury option yeah dare i say it yeah well, the, the option isn't seen as a luxury option. The option is, is that where we've got we've got the spaces, that's where we're able to to house. Um, yeah, it, you know, for those who like to spend their time in Cleveland Street and a number of uh, public houses, for those who are happy to be fed in the morning and turfed out and then go back, uh, it, it's a really good solution to what sometimes what they what they're left with. I mean, I say they they sort of designate 
the 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 uh, hotel but actually that's normally the place where we've got capacity i think we've increased our capacity by another 10 rooms there i think it, it could come in the future that will will take over the whole hotel and it, it's a very um viable business proposition for the owner i it's uh, it seems it seems really really odd to me i can't quite get my head around it <laughs> sorry <laughs> is it odd is the word i choose but i know what you're saying it, it does it does say in the report that um people you know they may go into a different um accommodation setting and you know they they're not paying the six pound um a week agreement that they have to pay it just to 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 be able to go back into the likes of castle hotel because they prefer that because they get more support as well um a question i didn't ask is what are what are we doing in regards to up, upskilling these individuals are we working with them to for them to go into employment? Um, maybe I'll take that up with Chris and Alan. Um, there, there is avenues for that, you know, and, and but normally that sort of comes along the journey in relation to they stabilise themselves, like we talk about that HMO. They move on to where they're in a more um, what we call traditional rented, and then it's all about taking them through that that journey. You know, um, I know that service is available. What's the one opposite the general hospital? There's there's one there. Um, is it Pobble up there? Oh, um, Adrev. Adrev. They 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 do that they do sort of thing up there. Yeah, they do that sort of and and sort of support up there. Yeah. Maria. Yes, Jay, Just checking. Uh, did you want me to go to the officers and get a response that I can circulate regarding your query? And yeah, all I think that would be, be worthwhile. Yeah? Um, you know. It's, we, we don't want them to come back to the hotel, do we? We want them to succeed in life and we want to provide them, you know, whether we, we have a, some development workers that work with them to and com communities for work or whatever to provide them with them um, with the skills and to move on. Okay, um, I'll add it to the action tracker then and I'll, uh, I'll get well, the response back to committee members as soon as I can. Brilliant, thank you. Um, yeah. Anybody else got anything? Rebecca, is it a legacy hand? <laughs> it is sort of, sorry, yes. Um, I, was, I was just wondering whether um, it is with the B and B option. So if people are kind of d defaulting, sort of returning back to that, uh, in one kind of capacity or another, is 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 it feasible at all to? limit the the kind of stay the 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 amount of stay the amount of returns that people can have or is it that capacity of other housing options is so limited that that just isn't a possibility basically if if the b and b was limited then then it would result in people then becoming homeless again yeah. so that's quite a long winded question i think rebecca's answered the wrong question there yes <laughs> yeah okay yeah. So just to follow on from that, um, have residents, I mean, it kind of goes a little bit hand in hand with kind of the, the sort of positive PR needed around uh, the kind of home um, perception of, you know, people being homeless. Um, have residents been, um, uh, not lobbied, but have they been, um, um, I don't know what the word is. have they been asked? asked basically if they just have, have they been asked whether they would be able to they have a spare room and you know if they get a particular amount of funding would they be able to kind of let that room out on a short-term basis as kind of like part of the temporary accommodation um housing solutions has, has that been considered or is there is that not feasible well, on a national basis, what you're coming back to is remember the days that everybody had a lodger. <laughs> it was a bit, uh, but uh, uh, 20, 30 years ago, people had lodgers. I mean, in some cities, that's 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 what they've got now. They've got that spare room. Um, I, I got to be honest. I think that our situation, and I use the term maybe badly, it's so chaotic in the town centre mm -hmm. that the same perception would exist about giving someone like that a room as a lodger. Is, is we need to stabilise. And unfortunately, until we stabilise those numbers and until we move them out from the Castle Hotel and, and transition people away from that, um, I don't know uh, if we're going to get to that. But I know in other places that has been 
a reasonable solution in some respects. But of course, you've got um, the RSL is in it, who in, uh, can be quite unscrupulous as well. And that's what's happening now because the the um, property market in Merthyr is quite buoyant, is that um, they, they're looking to set up and move on, you know, to getting that, that quick profit in, in relation to, and, and that's creating creating another issue for us. So it's um, it's um, it's a really difficult uh, uh, environment, but after reading the report this week and talking with the team and going through it, what encouraged me that there are solutions, but they are a bit further down the track, as I say, only within six months, we'll start to see things moving. And I think in 12 months, We'd be in a better place, but there's going to be some difficult times. You know, we got a bad Christmas, a bad winter coming, so everybody tells us. So there's going to be difficult times, isn't it? Thanks, Kev. Hilary? Okay. I'm mute. Uh, yeah, I just want to, I don't, sorry, I don't know if I missed something, but there, there was a well -be, workload and well-being report attached. Yeah. Are uh, there some really emotive um, quotes there from staff? within yes. the housing department was it just for information provided or just for us to read a note or i, th I think you could have asked questions on if if you wanted to yeah. there's, there's some really positive stuff in there and there's some really yeah hard hitting stuff as well there's, there's quite a mix there that, that that's for sure yeah there, there certainly is it, it did it did make for um interesting but also difficult reading on yeah, yeah. and, and if i may just pick up um on the lodging i thought that was interesting what you mentioned there kevin lodges and i was thinking back when i was a child to the street i lived in uh within the merthyr area and i was just thinking well the lodges i knew then were out working on the pits all day they came home had some food went out to the pub had a couple of pints and came back they weren't in the person's home yeah. very long they were sleeping yeah. In today's modern sort of world we live in, you know, people tend to have their own rooms. They often are there on yeah. a computer. You know, it's, it's a very different environment. Yeah. So I guess it, the context is very dif different today, isn't it? To, it, to it almost seems quite, um, what can I say? It's a bit like the Larkins and it seems really like my dad lodged. Uh, with a family and their son my dad's dead now but their son now comes and does handy jobs for my mum who's still alive they built up such a good relationship and he's in his 70s and he comes to do but it's all from my father lodging with them 80 years ago you know but it, it was it was a very um i think it was a different world then wasn't it? it was sort of uh, it was a different world yeah and, and researching my family tree and then you know looking at the census you know 80, 100 years ago, whatever it was, and you know, you, you'll see everybody living in the house, and it, nine times out of ten, there's a lodger within within that house. And, you know, you're talking, there's like ten people in a in a three bedroom property or whatever, and a lodger's got his own room. So yeah, different he times. He <laughs> yeah. brought the money in. Yeah. Um, yeah, Maria's just put in a chat, Hilary. Um, if you have any questions on a document to forward them and she get the answers for you. Thank you. I, I think there's why do they I think there's also a lot about the uh, virtual and home working and all that stuff in there. That's oh, yeah. kind of a, a thread. There's a lot of thread about that. Um and it's interesting we were trying to push this kicking and screaming before COVID. Now it's all come along. I think there's some great benefits, but then also you do miss that personal contact, I think, and that um that that uh, getting together that that that's what humans are like you know so uh, there's a yeah. lot of interesting stuff in there and that as well i thought yeah yeah i agree i i've done both you know i didn't go into into work for over a year um year and a half and you know it did affect me and it affects it's affected everybody in different ways um i like that interaction with people and engaging with people um I, there's some positives and there's some negatives out there yeah. you know, so having, a, having a balance between the two i think um, well, you, you know, were to say I didn't. Sir, you <laughs> you were to say I didn't. Uh, <laughs> I had seven months of it. Yeah, I well, yeah, I um, it, it, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't great. I um, yeah, it was like it was spending time. With, I at the start of it, I thought it was going to be the best school teacher in the world. It was like <laughs> I think it was about five days before I realised that I would never want to do teaching ever again. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, all right. Well, I think that's that's it. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, Thank you very much, Grid. Yeah. Um, yeah. Item agenda seven. Any other business? I don't have any. Um, take care, everyone, and I'll see you in four yeah. weeks, I guess.